Howdy folks and welcome to The Daily Coin. My name is Rory and today is Friday, August the 12th, 2016 and I have the very distinct honor and great pleasure of welcoming to the show for the first time, but not the last, Mr. Larry White and Larry's work you can find over at LoneStarWhiteHouse.blogspot.com and Larry, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate you taking time to have me on. Well, I'm glad you're here. And we are going to uh, to take a look at the SDR, the IMF, and the upcoming G20 meeting that's going on in China. We have a lot to cover. So you ready to take off and dive in? Well, we'll give it our best shot. And let's make it happen. All right. Thanks. Information. Right. It's just information. I don't have anything to sell either. But I, I have to say that over that through the years, my research has all pointed towards that the IMF and the central banks around the world, the BIS, the World Bank. I don't see that that any of these organizations have our have our best interest at heart. I really don't, and that's the only slant that I apply to any of my writings because. I read their documents, I listen to what they say, and I see the policies that are instituted, and it never benefits us. That's, that's, well, I understand. Right. I, that's, that's very, uh, you know, it's a very widely held view, and I, you know, I certainly understand that. And, and I, you know, from, if, you know, how I was raised and everything, I'm, I've been, I'm pretty skeptical of, you know, centralization of power and all things like that, too. So that's the kind of the angle I come at. I guess it's been a little surprising to me when I've had a chance to talk to some of these people that we're talking about. And I've, what I've learned is, is that you can't make a blanket assumption about those. You know, I mean, I mean, the, the, the final pr- proposals they put out, you know, may be like you're saying, but there's people within there that don't necessarily agree with everything. That's, I mean, you know, it's not like they're, you can paint everybody with a brush and say they all are uniform in how they think. So No, I understand that. I understand that, that you have to look at the individual trees within the forest. Right. And I do understand that. However, the forest seems to be winning. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think it'd be fair. I don't think hardly anybody would argue with the point that, you know, if you're coming at it from the perspective of a central bank or the IMF, or, you know, you're, you're in, you like global solutions. You like, you know, like things where power is centralized, you want to be able to have control of the system at a, you know, at a centralized level. And, you know, that's just their perspective of how they see things. And so, and, 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 you know, I definitely would agree that oftentimes the people in those positions, you know, they're, they're kind of disconnected from regular people and they make decisions and they, don't, and they may or may not care what happens or they, or they don't have enough real connection with real people to know how it would impact them. So exactly. So that's definitely a problem. And I'm actually it's in my minuscule problem. way. I'm sorry. It's a huge problem. Yeah, I agree. And in, in my minuscule way, that is almost nothing. But I'm trying. I'm actually trying to do whatever I can to bridge that gap a little bit. Like, like, like I say, when I talk to one of those people, I'll say, you know, you realize the average person would think this, so that they can hear that. Because I, you know, a lot of those people, they just kind of are in their own uh, group. That they're, they're around people that think similar to them, and they don't hear another opinion. Right. And so uh, at least, at least they hear that. And, and I'm surprised a lot of times they come back and say, well, you know, I agree with that. You know, so it's, it's just that's what I've learned, I guess, in this process is that you, you have to take every person individually. And But I, I hear you loud and clear on what you're saying on the organizations and the policies and all that. And, and I, I try to stay away from commenting or giving an opinion on my, on my blog because I'm just, you know, I don't want to I don't want people to come to my blog and think I'm trying to get them to believe what I believe. I want them to think that, you know, here's the information and you form your own opinion, but I do want to give you both sides so that you can make a better opinion. Right. And, you know, just recently, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, group of 30 or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, and I just, I just, I just was introduced to this, to this group uh, back just on August the 4th, mm-hmm. found a link over at Mr. Pringle's website, The Money Trap. Yeah. Yeah. And followed was, it, and and I was shocked to say the least. And the in the article that I wrote to introduce my audience to to this very highly secretive, in my opinion, group of individuals is if their intentions were honorable, 
then why aren't they addressing policies like Forex market rigging, like LIBOR market rigging, like gold and silver market rigging, all of which have been proven in a court of law. But none of the policies that the Group of 30, the IMF, the, the BIS, the World Bank, any central bank, none of them, not a single one, is writing anything that addresses these crimes against humanity. When you rig the Forex market, when you rig the LIBOR market, those are crimes against humanity. Because if you have anything, if you as an individual human being on this planet have anything to do with currency, or if you have a loan of any type anywhere on this planet, then you are directly impacted by this market rigging, by this manipulation where these people are skimming massive profits from these markets. Those are crimes against humanity, in my opinion, and there's no one addressing that. There's no, no, I, I, none of these groups or organizations are addressing that. So that brings into question for me their what what is their intention? They have no honor. What is their character? If they're not if if what it, what is their intention? If your intention is to influence policies, if your intention is to influence regulations and laws why aren't the why aren't these on the table you know what i mean i mean oh, sure. that's kind of it's I like everything you said are very valid questions and concerns i and i i think there's lots of people that feel the same way i mean you know look at what's happening the brexit vote the i think most of the trump supporters would you know feel this i mean I, you know i think that's not an unreasonable set of questions to ask at all no i wouldn't i, this, I don't I'll just, think so <laughs> with, Robert, with Robert Pringle, you know, I, I mean, again, you just got to understand, I didn't even know this person three months ago. You know, so <laughs> so, so uh, he was the former executive director of that group for, for eight years. Really? And I've just been stunned that he would even answer an email to me, you know, or talk wow. to me. And so, and, but he does, and he's very nice and, and he'll answer any question. And a lot of the things that you said, he feels somewhat the same way. And that's what's been surprising to me. Is I mean, he's like he's reached a real point of frustration. He looks around. Did you see the article I ran where he where I quoted him about what he said about the current policies? Uh, I, I must have missed that. Okay, yeah. This about a week or so ago, I've got an article on my blog. You can look it up. Where he gave me a quote. If you got a second, I'll read it to you, please. Okay, th this is. I just blew my mind because you know I wouldn't say anything like this. <laughs> But I'll read you what he told me. And he gave me permission to use it. And he basically says that any help I can give them, the people like him that are trying to help improve things, and that he's appreciative of it. So, so that's what I mean. It's that's was real surprising to me because I would have never imagined someone like that would be that way. So he wrote on his blog, you've probably seen, he wrote these articles about current monetary, monetary policies are immoral as well as ineffective. Okay. All right. So here's the, and so I, I featured his blog articles, but then, and then he gave me this quote to add on. He said, Larry, current, current monetary policies, are, I'm quoting him here, are immoral because they weaken the institution of money, the crucial coordinating mechanism of every society. Following the inequitable allocation of losses from the 2008 great financial crisis, policymakers are knowingly further widening inequalities and divisions in society. These monetary mandarins treat people as tools to the realization of ends that they, not the people, have chosen. They also view people as so stupid they will not understand what is going on. That's a direct quote. See, and that needs to be and I think widely he would agree. known. I think you'd probably agree with that quote. I agree wholeheartedly with that. But see, he's the former executive director of the group of party. <laughs> That's what's been surprising to me. <laughs> you know, when I as I work on this, cause, it, you know, I would have never dreamed someone like that would, would give me a statement to use like that. that that's I'm stunned. Well, <laughs> I, I was too. 
<laughs> so, so what I'm trying to do, like when someone like that, you know, he's, he's putting himself, I mean, he's, he's criticizing people that he knows here. I mean, you know, and so, I mean, I don't know if you know much about him, but I mean, he writes, he's the editor of centralbanking.com. I mean, he knows every head of every central bank in the world. He knows people like Robert, uh, Paul Volcker. I mean, you know, he's very highly connected. So, and he knew I was going to make this statement on, you know, the blog. So, so, you know, that's pretty courageous in my view to, to be willing to take, to make a statement like this. So what I'm trying to do is anyone that's like that, you know, I just try to make sure the information is people know it's there and, you know, that they're aware that there are people like this that exist. <laughs> well, it sounds like that he actually has a soul and that he yeah, sounds and, and, to me very, very straightforward guy. Every email I've had. With him. Yeah. See, I mean, and, and for me, it, it's a lot of it. I just look at it and go, well, that person couldn't possibly have a soul. I mean, for them to institute these types of policies that run contrary to everything that is good and how these policies get you know foisted upon upon us without any regard seemingly without any regard for the people except for well there's there's this whole group of ATMs out there and we need to extract as much wealth from them from those ATMs as possible you and I look at it and go, well, that's a group of human beings you're talking about. And that's where some of the, some of the real problems come in for me is, is that back in 2008, when everything kind of crashed and burned is they, the federal, the federal reserve in conjunction with the United States, Treasury Department came out and boldface lied to not only the American people, but to the entire world and said that all of these issues that we're having are due to a situation with the bank, with these, with this one or two banks, when in fact it had to do with the Federal Reserve itself. The next thing that we know as the American people, we're being threatened with martial law. We're being threatened with tanks in the street. Unless you pay the ransom, I'm sorry, unless you bail out these banks to the tune of $750 billion, turns out to be somewhere between 16 and $23 trillion. But that's never been discussed. It's never been discussed how these ongoing this ongoing theft has, has it never it never gets discussed anymore. None of the problems from my perspective, and you can help me to understand this. And I, I believe you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the upcoming G20 meeting is going to attempt to address. The fact that what happened in 2008 has never been corrected, never been addressed, and it's only gotten so much bigger and so much worse that now it's becoming unsustainable. And none of none of what they're none of these magic tricks that they keep trying are working anymore. They're just not working. Or am I wrong? Is that now? Is that? I wouldn't have any reason to dispute anything you said there. I, um, I, I agree with all the people that think that the system is really unstable and eventually all these policies are going to fail and we're probably going to have a way worse crisis. I mean, I, that's why I write the blog. Yep. Because I think those are all important things that people need to be thinking about and, and dealing with. And so I'm just saying. Yeah, that's all true, and you know, and whether you know, it may or may not happen. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but if it does, you know, then what's going to happen? Well, yeah, yes. Then what's going to happen is the IMF and them, they're going to come forward with their idea of how to fix it, and the governments of the world are going to put pressure on them to fix it so it fits, so they does what they want, and then the people that don't like the IMF, they're going to come forward and try to convince everybody just kind of like what you said, that we shouldn't listen to any of them. We ought to just throw the whole thing. I mean, all that's going to come to the surface in a big confusing conflict. 
at that point. So all I'm trying to do, I can't really resolve all that. <laughs> you know, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just an accountant that goes to his job every day. <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to do is make people aware of these, these issues are real. They exist. They're important. They need to think about them. They need to think about how they would deal with it if it happens. You know, and I don't know what else I can really do you know, for, as just an average person. Yep. And, and that's, that's all the only capability I know of that I have. And that's what I'm trying to do with the blog. Well, I think you do a great job with it, Larry. And I wanted to ask you, uh, if you would just kind of describe for the audience, what an SDR is the special drawing rights we hear. My audience is somewhat familiar with what an SDR is, but they may not know what it actually is and what its specific purpose is. And if you would just kind of share that with, with everyone. All right. I'll try to give you my layman's version. Okay. Um, the SDR stands for special drawing, right? That's what the word stand, the, the acronym stands for. And it's just a unit of account that they use at the IMF to keep track of records there. And it, and it acts like a currency for the major central banks and the governments. It's a currency that they may own and trade back and forth between themselves. And they actually, you know, it has an interest rate and the IMF keeps up with all of that. But for us out here in the real world, the average person, it's almost meaningless because you, the, I, the SDR, the official reserve SDR used at the IMF for this purpose is not a currency that you could go into the store and use as legal tender anywhere in the world. There's no place you could take an SDR and buy anything with it. And so it's possible over time that they could make changes and, and there's various proposals that would change that situation. And that's what I track on my blog, you know, monetary system changes where the SDR could change in that role and it could become more like a currency. It could become legal tender or a version of it or an electronic version. Or, you know, who knows what all the different ways it could be done in, in the modern world. But it's possible that the SDR could be promoted and uh, to be used more like a, an actual money that you would think of as money. And so that's why I track it and follow it on the blog is because, you know, if we reach that point where that happens, then everyone's definitely going to need to understand it and know about it as it is today. You know, if it didn't ever change from today, you probably don't need to worry about it or know about it because you, you're never going to have any in your billfold and you're never going to be able to spend it. You're never going to own a bond that's in it. You know, none of that's ever going to happen unless they change from the way it is right now. It's interesting that you use the word bond because right now and at the upcoming G20 meeting, I believe that that's on the table as far as one of the topics of discussion is is reintroducing an SDR bond. They, they tried this back in the, in the mid seventies or the early seventies and they discontinued them in 1980 because they, they, they never uh, took off and people weren't, weren't interested in them. I think that right. there's a little bit more interest in them now because of the financial situation that we have on a global scale. And there's an, what I read about and I found out about through, through your blog, actually, uh, Larry, what is the M S D R and the yes, M S D R could potentially be a bond that either runs parallel with the U S treasuries or could potentially replace that as well as morph into other types of actual currency. Is that is that not right, or am I? No, I, I think I that's that? right. Uh, th this is a really confusing boy. When I read stuff, it, I get confused myself, just trying to follow all the different people <laughs> trying to that try to explain this, and it's you know it's definitely confusing. Okay, this is my best understanding. There is an official SDR, you know that that's sanctioned within the IMF system and central bank. You know, this thing you're talking about is what they are calling the MSDR. And it's not even really a currency. All it really is is a way to value an asset like a bond. For example, um, let's say I, I'm going to do an example on my blog soon that to hope, hopefully will help people get see this better. And I actually ran this example past Jim Rickards, and he told me I got it right. So that's that's good. But what? let's say that you wanted to own a 10,000 SDR bond or MDSDR bond. 
that was denominated in MDSDR. So all that means is, is that instead of it being exchangeable into dollars, if you sold it, it's theoretically exchangeable into MSDRs. But, it, you know, if you sell it. Okay. So, so what does that mean? What do I have if I have an MDSDR? Because I can't spend an S M MSDR anywhere. It's not a currency. Well, that's right. You can't. All it is is a way to ascribe a value to it from a currency standpoint because the, the SDR is a basket of currencies. I know you know this, but yes, sir. right now there's four currencies that make it up and then they're going to add the Chinese currency soon. So there'll be five. And the, the value of the SDR trades every day in fluctuation with all those currencies, just like it was its own currency. And so what you could do, and go back to our example, let's say you wanted a 10,000 SDR bond for some reason, and you could buy one, an MDSDR bond. And the, and the IRF, uh, IMF has a daily exchange rate, and they say, okay, we will give you one SDR if you give me a dollar forty in US dollars. That's the exchange rate for that day. And that's the day you buy the bond. So if I want to buy that bond, I'm going to have to give them 14,000 US, or not necessarily IMF. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. They wouldn't be issuing this bond. Maybe a bank would issue it or some private entity because MSDRs are private SDRs outside the IMF. So if you gave this bank a dollar, uh, $14,000, they'd give you a $10,000 quote MSDR bond that you would now own. And all you would really own is a bond that is denominated in MSDRs. It means its value is going to fluctuate on from a currency standpoint as those currencies in the basket fluctuate against each other every day. So now a month from now, something comes up and I need my, you know, my money back and I decide to sell the bond. So what am I going to get? Okay, well, the currencies have changed rates that make up that basket over the months. And so let's say the dollar was a dollar forty when we bought our bond, but now the dollar has gone down in value a little bit, and it, and it takes a dollar forty-two to buy one SDR. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So now I'm going to sell my bond. Well, if I sell it at the new exchange rate, I'm not going to get ten thousand MSDRs, which is what my bond is. I'm going to get fourteen thousand two hundred US dollars, I'm, and I'm going to get a two hundred dollar gain in US dollars from what I bought it at because. It, of the exchange rate change between the SDR and the dollar during the time I owned it. And that's the only way right now that I could own an MSDR bond and actually use it in the real world for anything. You know, I can't take that bond. I mean, I don't know. Maybe somebody would let you use it as collateral or something. But you can't spend it. You can't. You can't. You can't. If you, you understand what I'm trying to say. Yes. You can't get an MSDR note, hundred dollar note, and put it in your billfold. Those things don't exist mm -hmm. anywhere. Right, and so right. you have to then take that and switch it back into a freely usable currency. Like you could switch it into dollars, you could switch it into euros, yen, or mar or uh, pounds, or, or any or yen or whatever. Or you could even actually split it into the exact ratio of the basket and ask for your money in each each currency. You know that makes up the bat. You, know, you can do any of those things. But that's how that's a a real world example of how a so called SDR or MDSDR denominated bond would work. And those are going to be their their the goal, the the Chinese. Their goal is to be able to introduce this new MSDR. It's not available currently, but they are definitely pushing to bring this to the world. And their one of their goals is to be able to offer it in like just like in the example that that you use there, Larry, as far as you and I, any individual being able to go into a bank and and purchasing the or acquiring these bonds. And that, from my perspective, I mean, and once again, I, I need your help. That is kind of a game changer as yes. far as as far Absolutely. as what it is, what it can is what this new msdr bond could do because as you explained you could use that as collateral and from my and from my perspective at that point if i'm using that if i'm using something in that in that manner as collateral to so i've gone into you know my local bank i've purchased 10,000 msdr bonds I've plopped down my fourteen thousand dollars. Now I've got this ten thousand unit um, MSDR bond, and I go back to the bank and I say I want to use this as collateral 
to build a new garage. And yes, they sir. say, okay, we'll do that. At that, at that moment, doesn't that become, doesn't that start acting like a currency at that point? Yes, I think it does. And I, and I think that is what they're trying to do. They, I think they want to introduce this as a like, sort of like a, I'd call it a baby step towards, you know, a full fledged use of the SDR as a global currency. I, yes. I absolutely think that's, but, you know, but it, I guess I want, I'm trying to help people understand they're not going to announce, I don't think, at the G20 that suddenly there's going to be a new global reserve currency and we're going to, the dollar is going to be gone. I mean, I don't think anything that dramatic is going to happen. No. It's going to be like the first little baby step down the path towards that maybe end game. But, and that might take a year, it might take five years, or it might take 10 years to get to that point. And one of the, one of the topics also, Larry, is, has been one of the topics that's, that is, that's been brought to the table. I'm not sure if they're going to discuss this at, at this upcoming meeting, but it has definitely been floating around out in the air. And that is the reintroduction of gold into the SDR uh, basket of currencies. Now, if that happens, and I feel confident that the Chinese in particular are pushing pretty hard for that to happen, and they want that to happen, that could really kind of change the whole dynamics of the SDR and in particular this MSDR and that that's when it can really get interesting in my opinion or is the is the whole gold conversation just is it still just out in the air at this point do you think well, of course, all I can do is give you my best guess because <laughs> they don't invite me to the meetings where they might talk about things. <laughs> but uh, but I can I can give you a little bit of an informed opinion just based yes. on what I have. Um, I, I, okay, first thing to say, and I want to be sure to mention this. You know, Willem Middle Middlecoop, who we've talked about, he, he has just released today uh, an outstanding article that it touches exactly on what you're talking about. So I would encourage anyone that would be interested to go and re I, I actually just released an article on my blog this morning that covers it and has a link to it, or you can go straight to his cdfund.com website and he's got it posted there, but it's a great article. It, it talks about everything you just mentioned and it's the best newest information I've seen anywhere. So that'd be the first thing to say is that's a great source for people that want to look into that, what you just talked about. As far as in his article, he talked, he kind of lays out the history of, in the past, when it's studies that have been done or people that have talked about the idea or, or supported the idea of using the a gold as part of the basket that determines the value of the SDR, which I think is probably what you're referring to. Yes, sir. So anyway, he, he discusses all that and he, he does believe that you know that is part of the discussion, that he has contacts that he knows in China that give him good information that he believes. And he thinks that, you know, that China does have, there are people in China that, that, that would like to see that happen. Now, what I will say on the, on, I guess on the counterbalance to that is whenever I'm doing research for myself on all this, and I've actually written an article on my blog that says what I'm about to say, I try to look, you know, I look everywhere I can find. What is the Chinese officials said in their official statements? What does the PBOC chairman say? What is, you know, what is the IMF? What are these, when they release actual public statements, what do they say about that? Well, I can't find anybody anywhere that actually will say that something like that is under consideration officially. So, so the best information I would have is that if, if it is under consideration, it's something that's not being disclosed publicly at this time, but that doesn't mean it's not being discussed. So I just don't know is be, would be the answer, but I do know it has been discussed. I do know that, um, you know, like I've brought this up to people like Dr. Coates and Robert Pringle in emails, you know, and you know they're they're both they're not anti-goal by any means. They you know they wouldn't look at goal standard necessarily as the way to resolve issues that we have, but both of them understand the gold standard very well and, and they've spoken actually highly of how it was a, a stabilizing factor in the past. And I, I think they would, you know, be interested if, if the, if China's interested in something like that, they would be open to listening to that. So, I mean, my sense of it is, and just in a little bit of exchanges I've had with people like that is that there hasn't been any decisions made yet by anybody as to what's really going to be proposed as how this might work. There's just a lot of ideas, proposals, discussion, you know, academic guys trading ideas and things like that. 
And, you know, who knows what they'll end up actually doing. That's That would be my take on it at this point. Yeah, and, and I wasn't looking for any definitive answers. I, I just right. think that I think that it's interesting that it's it's actually coming back to the table. Yes. And that it is part of the of the discussion and at the IMF and I also find it interesting in the article that you reference, you know, uh Will, Willem uh Middlecop Middlecoop uh-huh. his new article and his and the title of it is IMF's substitution fund to kickstart SDR as new global currency with right. a question mark. And right. in that, in the very beginning of that, uh, Larry, he he brings up the idea of the possibility of a debt jubilee or a world reserve currency reset. I mean, and and those those kinds of words are like they're kind of a shock to the system from my perspective. I mean, you start talking about a global debt jubilee or global currency, world reserve currency reset, and in particular, in light of what we've just, of what you've just explained, as far as you know, gold standard and gold being reintroduced to the SDR basket, that can get really interesting pretty quickly. And what, how realistic do you think? would it be for there to be a debt jubilee? I mean, is that, is that realistic? And, and if, and if it is, what would that mean to somebody like yourself or myself, just the average person? I mean, what would, what would a debt jubilee mean to, to you and I? Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm probably not a good person to ask that question. I don't, I don't know if I understand all the implications well enough, but I'll, I'll give a shot here trying to give you what I think. Um, well, first, let me say that in, in the article that Willem has written and everything, I, you know, he does he does mention that. And, you know, sometimes when you read these articles, you get the feeling that they're trying to say to you, oh, this could all happen right away. Well, I, I've talked with it. He doesn't he doesn't necessarily think these things we're talking about are, are imminent. And so what I, I think is that all these ideas are being looked at, pursued behind this. You know, there, I think there is definitely a, a widespread recognition, both by critics of the system and high officials in the system that the current system is is wobbly. It's unstable, and it may not be sustainable. And at any time, we are susceptible to an unexpected event that could trigger a you know another massive crisis. Now, they're not going to come out and say that because you know their job as an official is not to panic the public. I mean, their public right. job is to to try to keep calm. So, but I don't think we. I think we can assume that they, if they are writing articles, it's and I've documented them on my blog where they say these risks exist and they take them very seriously. And I'm talking about officials now, not just people like William or Jim Rickard. Then, then we know they're real issues. So, to my mind, we're, it's, is it realistic? Okay, it's realistic the minute that crisis happens. Because as things are today, if, if everything stayed somewhere, sort of like it is for 20 more years and we didn't have a crisis, then I don't think you'd see a lot of all this happening any any quickly or happy. You, you might see little steps just like they're about to take that sort of just unfold over many, many years. But the minute the system becomes unsustainable and they have, a, you know, a, let's say there's a derivative crisis and banking crisis all over where you know, it just happens quickly. Which everybody understands is possible. Yes. Well, yes. then everything's on the table. I mean, you know, the whole system they've been using is not functioning anymore. <laughs> and so who knows what they might propose? And so I think, in anticipation of that being a real and serious possibility, they are looking at a variety of ideas as, as to how to deal with that. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think that, in my opinion, is pure, and this is pure speculation on my part is that in the order of the way they would do it is that they would first try to do the similar types of things they've already been doing, you know, QE, you know, until that completely doesn't work. And then if that, when that's not available as an option you know, or helicopter, all these things you hear, they'll try all of that. If, if, and if that works, then they'll keep doing it or, it's just, or it gives more time or whatever. If it doesn't, then they'll just take the next step down the path they have to take to try to restore confidence. Because at the end of the day, what they have to do no system is going to function unless most people will trust it. That's just the bottom line. And so they know that. And so they, if they have to come back and put a full 100% backing to a currency of some kind, you know, if that's what it takes, then I think, yes, they would absolutely do that. I just think it's at the very end of their list of, 
you know, solutions. Does that make sense? It it makes perfect sense, uh, Larry. And I think that what's happening right now is the people have, a lot of people have lost trust in these monetary policies Uh and the ones that still trust it, only trust it, not like they used to. It's not a hundred percent. I I wouldn't argue with that. I mean, uh, I yeah. think that you have def- people. There's wrong. definitely more general awareness that something doesn't feel right. That's something sure. is wrong. Something <laughs> is very very wrong. It's not that it doesn't feel right. It's just plain old wrong. And it's it's it seems like that at at any time one of these derivatives that's just floating around in this extremely opaque black hole where derivatives live that any one of those could come unglued and all of a sudden we have an uncontrollable situation that is just kind of bouncing around freely from country to country to bank to bank to system to system there there wouldn't be any control of that at all i mean look at what happened last year when Hetta Bank in Austria, a small bank in Austria, blew up and their derivatives book blew up, two weeks later, it's affecting a, a bank in Germany. They didn't see that. They were able to contain it. The whole, they didn't get away from them. But something on just a slightly larger scale, I don't think they're going to be able to contain. Exactly. And, and, that's, and that's a very realistic scenario that I've just it, described. It, it's already it happened. Is, and, and I've got on my blog documented warnings from both the BIS and the IMF about exactly that. You know, they recognize it as a true systemic risk. It is. And, and so, you know, it's, what I'm trying to emphasize when I say that, the reason I go back to the way and why I document them on my blog is obviously people that are outside the system or critics, you know, they say these things all the time. And that's one source. But when people inside the system are in agreement, I mean, I think we can all agree that that's a real problem. <laughs> Time to pay attention. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I'm trying to say. That's really the message I'm trying to get across. You know, if you're the average person out here that only cares about the football game, you probably need to at least carve out an hour over here to start looking into these kinds of issues and problems and thinking about them because they are real. And, and you know, and you, if you don't believe they're real, just go read what these you know, officials are saying. Exactly. See, and that's, that's what, that's one of the things that I really like about what I'm currently doing, which is researching or digging pretty deep into the IMF and the SDR in particular, because what the officials are saying and they are documenting is terrifying. I mean, and, and, it, and the people, and if you read their words, that's if that doesn't get your attention, then I I don't know what else to, I don't know what else to say. I mean, uh-huh. all you have to do is read their words, and it's like, oh my god, these people are scared too, <laughs> and they're yeah. they're in charge of the levers. Well, uh, yeah, exactly, and, and now of course you know it varies. I mean, I'm sure there's people inside the system that are less concerned, and they think they've got a handle on things and all that. And, you know, I'm sure there's a variety of opinions, but there's definitely plenty of People, both former people like Dr. Coates and Robert and others that are still in the system that, well, I'll give you an example. Claudio Borio at the BIS, he's the chief economist at the BIS. I've got several of his papers and speeches highlighted on my blog. And he says very directly that we cannot continue this debt fueled system that these, mon- in fact, I just had a, a article this week that he uh, featured that where he said that. You know, the current monetary policies are at best, you know, risky, at worst dangerous, and they risk calling into question the legitimacy and credibility of central banks. I mean, this is Claudio Borio. This isn't, you know, Donald Trump or something. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a person who is highly respected in the system. And so if he's saying that, and then you also have Jim Sinclair saying that, and you have Jim Rickard saying that, and you have William Miller, I mean, if, if, as soon as you do a little bit of digging and try to learn about these issues, then you'll realize that there's a real widespread agreement that that problem exists. And it's very real. Yes. And and so I'm f- hoping that people will, the first step that anybody has to take is to believe there's a problem. 
Right. If there's a problem, you're not even, you know, you're not going to read anything or listen to anybody or do anything. So, so that's step number one. And then after that, you know, I think the wisest thing to do is start trying to inform yourself and, and listen to the variety of, you know, go to your site, the daily coin, go to all our, I go to alternative sites. I go to mainstream sites. I, I read everything. Jim Rickard, you know, there's great sources of information from all different directions. And, and so if you just take some time and start learning, that's the next step. And then I try to help people along the way with that on my blog because I try to kind of do the work for them of going through all that and condensing it down, hopefully, to something that's hard, easier to, you know, well, most people don't have time. It takes a lot of time to do It does that. take a lot of time. So, so I try to do it for people on the blog as best I can. But, you know, I'm, it's not going to be perfect because I may have a little different thing I would think is important than they would. But, but anyway, that's. That's step two. And then the third step is, you know, now that you're informed, you know, you need to figure out, OK, well, if all this stuff really happened, what would I do? You know, how would I protect my family? What you know, you need to have a plan in mind. And I'm not going to tell anybody what that should be. That's not my place. But you need to think about it and you need to have an idea of what you would do, because you might really be faced with it as hard as that is to believe, because right now all you care about is the next football game. But one of these days it might be different. And so. And then the fourth step would be to take action. You know, oh, absolutely. Because if you're not yeah. taking action and it's just running around in your brain, right? then it means absolutely nothing and nothing is happening. That's exactly. And and action is going to be an individual thing. I mean, I can't tell everybody what they should do. You know, I, I know what right. I try to do in my for my family and things like, you know, I mean, I try to have an emergency fund. I, I think holding things like precious metals in that or, you know, I, I think all that stuff's important. But I can't tell another person who's in a completely different situation from me what they should try to do. Well, we're not trying to do that. I'm just I'm just saying that you need to do something. You right. need to do what is best for your particular situation Absolutely. and what best fits your family and your family's needs. And then take another look uh, just outside of that at your community. What can I, what part, what is my part in, in my community and how can I help them? What exactly. do I need to, what do I need to have on hand in, in case some of this stuff does happen? Well, how, how am I going to be able to help them as well? So it's, it's a lot to think about. It's a lot to do. And as, as we started this whole conversation, Larry, you know, you and I both look at, not look at, but we research from a wide variety of sources and we try to bring those sources to our respective audiences in a condensed form exactly. and that's that's all that's all that we can do and i'm not trying to tell just like you i'm not trying to tell anyone how to do what to do what to think i'm just presenting information that's my whole goal and i hope that people learn from it i hope that they that they act upon it because if you don't i'm i'm sorry but when you have these various officials from around the world that are all that a lot of them are saying the same thing. There are, like you pointed out, Larry, there are people that have a, a contrarian view to what is being said. But when I, when I read like the article that you pointed out or the, the communique from uh, Borio within the IMF saying that this is a huge problem. And it's potentially dangerous. I mean, that's that's were his words. Absolutely, and and I have a lot of respect for him. I've read a lot of his. He he doesn't mince words, and I mean, I don't I don't think he's trying to cause people to panic or anything like that. I don't, and I don't want to misrepresent anything he's saying. But I think right say this is a real risk. You need to take it seriously. I take yeah. it seriously. You need to take it seriously. That's what, that's what I mean. As far as, you know, <laughs> listening to the people that are in control of the levers, this man is in control of the levers and he's telling you flat out, you should be concerned. You should be paying attention to this because it's potentially dangerous. Well, we've been speaking with, uh, Mr. Larry White, and you can find all of Larry's great work over at LoneStarWhiteHouse.blogspot.com. 
Larry, certainly appreciate all the knowledge and all your time this afternoon and look forward to speaking with you in the not too distant future. Well, thank you, Roy, and I appreciate your willingness to let me come on and, uh, and share the information. Well, we will pick it up in the, in, the, in the near future, and you have a great weekend. Okay, you too.